Everybody? Tonight we're going to have more fun than Christians believe they're allowed to have. But I have to tell you in all honesty that uh, there are going to be points along the way when it's not going to feel fun. Like bungee jumping or downhill skiing or skydiving. There are points at which you think, why did I do this? But if you can just take in the beauty of the moment and process what's happening, even skydiving is glorious, even though it doesn't feel fun at certain points along the way. Now, we're going to begin our fun this evening with a little bit of a theological riddle. I'd like to play with your minds just a little bit. There's a figure in Christian history who has gone down in Christendom as an individual who is both famous and infamous. I mean, there's positive and negatives about this guy. Augustine of Hippo was known to have said some extremely profound things that have carried on down to this very day that still have people, theologians, bright minds thinking and pondering the beauty of the things that he said. But he's a mixed bag because Augustine said a lot of profoundly beautiful things, theologically accurate and true things, but he also, well, he preached a lot of heresy. And his heresies have also come down through history to us, and, and the task of theologians, it seems, is always to figure out, is this one of Augustine's heresies, or is this one of his theological moments of brilliance, all right? So I'm going to put on the screen a little bit of a theological experiment. This is Augustine at his best or at his worst. You'll have to decide. Now, if I were you, I wouldn't answer out loud because it could be embarrassing. But you can answer out loud if you're a person who likes pain. <laughs> but at least answer in your own mind silently, true or false, love God and do as you please. Now, I know Ronnie Davidson believes this. But what about you? Is this a true statement or a false statement? Just in your mind, just ponder the statement just for a few seconds and answer silently in your mind, true or false. Love God and do as you please. Now, as we spend our time together this evening, uh, we are best served by me introducing to you a young lady whose name is Linda. Linda. Now, Linda was the kind of little girl who all she ever wanted to do was just grow up and get married. That was her whole goal. She saw her mommy, her daddy. It was so beautiful. She thought, that's what I want to do. I want to grow up. I want to meet Mr. Wonderful, and I want to get married. That's it. That was Linda's big goal in life, get married to the right man. Well, the next thing you know, she was 10 and then 15 and, and then 17 and, and then 18 and then here comes this guy out of nowhere. He has a great sense of humor. He's very, very good looking. He's polite and kind. He has so many of the attributes and the personality traits that she had imagined would be present in Mr. Wonderful. And there he was. And his name, he had such a great name. His name was Herman. So she could refer to him very conveniently as her man. Do you like that? She liked it. Don't make fun of Linda. This was her love life. She was so excited to meet this man, this man of her dreams. And sure enough, as the days turn into weeks and the weeks turn into months, next thing you know, before a year had passed, she had fallen, what do you think, in love. And she just knew in her heart, he loves me too. Sure enough, he dropped to one knee. And he popped the big question. You know this question. Say it out loud with me. Will you marry me? And what do you think Linda said? Yes. Well, this is Linda after all. All she ever wanted to do was grow up, meet Mr. Wonderful, and get married. Of course she said yes. Yes, Herman, I'll marry you. Well, the wedding day came, and it was picture perfect. They videotaped the whole thing, as you do. Put it up on YouTube for her family to watch over and over again. Don't do that to your family. Nobody wants to watch your wedding video over and over again. <laughs> Anyways, I digress. It was a picture-perfect wedding. And then 
you know, the car was prepared and off into the night they went for the honeymoon. Beautiful place prepared for them. And they were exhausted because it was so late and finally they fell asleep and at 5.30 a.m., Linda woke up to what felt like an odd presence in the room. She reached over for Hermie Cuddles, that's what she had started to call him, and he wasn't there. She opened her eyes and there was Herman standing by the bed. She thought, what is he doing awake so early in the morning? Strangely enough, he had a piece of paper in his hands. She said, what's that? He said, wake up, sweetie, the honeymoon is over and boy was it because Herman had in his hand a list that he had composed of Linda's daily duties in 15 minute increments so that she would never have to do the hard work of thinking again she said Linda he said Linda I'm I'm such an organized guy and I've done all the thinking for us so you don't have to and I just happen to have an authentic copy of one of these lists Linda shared it with me so I could share it with you. It says right at the top, doesn't it, Haley? It says Linda's list. Yes, it See, it's authentic. <laughs> this is Linda's list right here. And Herman, he handed it to her. She sat there in bed at 5.30 a.m. And sure enough, it said 5.30 a.m., first thing on the daily schedule. 5.30 a.m., awake and shower. It's Linda's list, not Herman's list. Awake and shower. Six. Awaken Hermie Cuddles with a gentle kiss. He didn't like alarm clocks. They startled him. Awaken Hermie Cuddles with a gentle kiss. 6.15, breakfast preparation. 7 a.m., serve breakfast. 7.45, meet husband at door with appropriate jacket in hand. In parentheses, pay attention to the weather. <laughs> Eight, <laughs> I'm sorry, can I get through this? Eight, <laughs> 8 a.m., free time. 8.15, breakfast cleanup. 9, clean house, see attached list. 12, noon, have lunch, anything you want but marked items. 1, clean windows. 2, mow the lawn. 3 p.m., weed the garden. 5 p.m., laundry and ironing. 6 p.m., dinner preparation. 6.30, meet Hermie Kettles at the door. 6.45, serve dinner. 7.45, free time. 8 p.m., dinner cleanup. 8.30, draw bath for husband. Some of you really love that. I could just hear that there is excitement over here somewhere. 9 p.m., massage for husband. This guy's got it made. 10 p.m., lights out, sweetheart, pleasant dreams. Pleasant dreams? More like horrific nightmares. <laughs> These lists kept coming to Linda in two-week periods with updates. And the days turn into weeks, and the weeks turn into months, and the months turn into years. Ten years had gone by with these lists collecting, and Linda with building anxiety, trying to obey the letter of the list. Trying hard to please Herman. And then after 10 years of marriage, from unknown causes, Herman dropped dead. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Linda was so conflicted emotionally, she didn't know what to do because on the one hand, her husband had just died, and you're supposed to grieve, I guess? And she knew she ought to, but she couldn't. But she tried, because she had mastered the art of trying and failing, and trying and failing. Well, as you might imagine, after Herman passed, Linda vowed that she would never get married Again, do you blame her? And she enrolled in karate lessons. <laughs> but this is Linda we're talking about, after all. This isn't 
the average little girl. This is Linda, who all she ever wanted to do was grow up and get married, and it just didn't work out. But even though she vowed never to get married again, here comes this guy. He's charming. He's handsome. He's polite. In a lot of ways, he's like Herman. But in some ways, she thought, maybe he's different. And the day came after their relationship had developed, when Michael dropped to one knee and said, Linda, will you marry me? And she nearly karate chopped him, but she said yes. <laughs> because this is Linda, after all. Very reluctantly, yes, I'll marry you, Michael. Well, the wedding was simpler the second time, and they didn't videotape it. And, but the honeymoon was nice, and there was a beautiful place prepared for them. And you can imagine the anxiety in Linda's heart, in her body, as at 5.30 a.m., she woke up in a start to find Michael standing by the bedside <laughs> with a piece of paper in his hands. She stood up onto the bed in karate stance, snatched that thing from his hands, tore it in two, and said, never again! To which... Michael responded and said, baby, I've been up for two hours writing that poem for you, and I was going to sing it to you on my guitar. <laughs> Don't you even want to hear it? Oh, Linda felt so bad. She, she took up the torn piece of paper, and she read the words to the most beautiful love song she had ever heard in her life, and Michael stood there by the bedside and sang it to her, and, and when he was done singing the song... He served breakfast in bed, and then Haley, he ironed all her clothes, <laughs> took her order for lunch, Ronnie, and as the days turn into weeks and the weeks turn into months, the months turn into years, after 10 years of marriage to Michael, wonderful Michael, Linda found herself rummaging around in an old box full of lists that had been written by Herman. Now, I don't know why she saved them, but she did. And she felt a nervousness come over her as she saw the box. But she opened it. And she pulled out one of the lists. And she had an amazing realization. She sat there looking at the list, and she said to herself, wow, this is very odd. I do these very things. I mean, not all these things, but these very kinds of things for Michael, and he's never given me a list. Well, you think I made this story up, right? Right, right, right? Well, I kind of did. But it's from the Bible. This is the Apostle Paul's story. I just embellished it slightly. In Romans chapter 7, I want you to track with me because Paul can be a little bit complex, but if we can get what Paul is saying in this passage and a parallel passage in which Paul deals with the same subject in 2 Corinthians 3, we're going to look at these two passages of Scripture tonight, and if we can wrap our minds around this, the gospel will come to us with supreme clarity, and there will be liberation in the house this evening. So track with Paul. He says, do you not know, brethren, and then you see in parentheses, that Paul wants us to know who his audience is. So he says, do you not know, brethren, parentheses, for I speak to those who know the law. Pause right there. This passage of scripture by the apostle Paul has a, what do we call it today, a target audience. It's addressed to a particular, what do we call it, a demographic Who's the target audience? Who's the demographic? Those who know the law. So who was that in Paul's ancient historical context? That would be the Jewish nation as a whole, not the Gentiles, of course. They didn't know the law. They weren't the commandment-keeping people of God. They were not in any sense being addressed here. Not the Gentiles. They're addressed other places in Romans, but not here. Paul says, hey, I have something. I have a message for those who know the law. That's who I'm addressing right now. In the ancient historical sense, again, who would that be? 
the Jews, Israel. More specifically, maybe the Pharisees among the Jewish nation, right? Those who regard themselves as those who know the law. Now, in a modern context, who would Paul be addressing? I mean, take a wild guess. Who is that people group who claim to know and preach the law? Who are those who are the commandment-keeping people of God? Who are those who today know the law? Well, just turn to your left, turn to your right. <laughs> Paul would be addressing Seventh-day Adventists, wouldn't he? Okay, so if this is specifically addressed to those who know the law, let's see what Paul has to say to those who know the law. He says, do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has, what's that word? Dominion over a man as long as he lives. The law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Does that sound positive or negative to you so far, this idea of the law having dominion? Positive or negative? Just off the cuff. It sounds negative, right? I think Paul is framing this negatively on purpose, and you'll see why. Well, in the next verse, verse 2, he tells a little parable, a little story, and he says, for the woman who has a husband, very similar to the story that I just told you, for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives, right? You make the marriage vow, you say, I do. He says, I do. You're married. And she is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. Are you tracking with Paul's reasoning? Because he's about to make a point. We need to know what he's telling us in his preliminary little parable in order for the theological punchline to make sense. He's saying, listen, if a woman is married to a man... She's bound by the law of marriage to her husband as long as he lives. The only way out is if he what? Dies. He goes on. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. That's not cool. You shouldn't do that. Unless apparently you're a Mormon and you live in Utah, it's okay there. But not for these people and not for those who know the law. You can't do that, Paul is saying. You're married to him, you can't marry somebody else. Now watch what he says. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. The law of marriage, the covenant of marriage. She is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she is married to another man. So track with Paul here. How many women are there in his little parable? One. How many men, potential husbands? Two. Can you have both husbands simultaneously, according to Paul? No. Now watch with his reasoning here. Therefore, my brethren. Well, the therefore indicates that now he's going to come to his point. We want his point, don't we? Do you want his point? You're not sure. I hope you want his point. He says, therefore, my brethren, you also. What does also refer to? Well, like my little parable, he's, he's saying, okay, I told you this little story about one woman and two potential husbands. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law. He's made a transition now from the law of marriage, the covenant of marriage, to a theological point, and now he's talking about the law of God. And he's addressing every person who knows or has a relationship with God through that law. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. That you may be married to another. I want you to notice something. According to Paul, if you're going to get married to the second man in his little parable, you've got to die to the law in some sense. Now this is very uncomfortable for those who know the law because they've mastered the fine art of trying for so many years. And their security is in those efforts to measure up. So Paul is dealing here with some really, really fragile egos and emotions. And he knows it. And he goes on and he says something very fascinating. He says, okay, therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ that you may be married to another. Who's the first husband in Paul's parable as he makes his application? The law. 
Who's the second husband? Well, to him, be married to him who was raised from the dead that we should bear fruit to God. Who, by that description, would you say is the second potential husband? Jesus is the second potential husband. This is clear, right? So are we being theologically obedient to the text so far? Yes. The second potential husband is Jesus. Now, Paul is saying here very clearly, if you die to the law and get married spiritually to Jesus, you will bear fruit to God. You will become flourishing and thriving and you will bear fruit. Now, the metaphor here is marriage, so fruit here is the fruit of the womb spiritually. You'll give birth You'll experience spiritual development and growth, and you will advance in your spiritual walk. If you die to the, do you dare say it, law, and get married to Jesus. Well, Paul goes on, and he says, for when we were in the flesh, in our natural carnal state, when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Okay, it's a bad thing. The sinful passions, which were, this is a very odd thing for Paul to say to those who know the law. When we were in the flesh, the sinful passions, which were aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Well, if, if bearing good fruit is a thriving, growing, advancing, spiritual development, if you're married to Jesus, Paul is saying, if you stay married to the law, you're not going to be fruitful. In fact, you're going to produce spiritual death. You're going to gradually die spiritually if you keep trying to relate to God for salvation through the law. This is Paul's point. He's saying, listen, you need to die to the law. And he says that the, the sinful passions, the very thing, the very thing that we strive to overcome when we are list-oriented, don't sin, don't sin, don't sin, don't look at that, don't listen to that, stop, stop, stop. Sinful passions, according to Paul, are actually stimulated by the law. The very thing that we regard as positive has a downside. It has a negative effect when it comes to sinful passions. We know the law in and of itself. If you just take the law and you separate it from the human being as an objective code of ethics, right? We know from verses 12, 13, and 14, Paul goes on. He says, well, the law is good. It's holy, just, and good. It's spiritual. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with the law. But when the law interacts with a fallen human being... The law produces more sin, not less sin. And some of you have experienced this, and I know you have because you've talked with me over the last few days. There are people in this room right now who are on anxiety medication because of legalism-induced anxiety. You've told me. You've said, the only way I've survived Adventism is to self-medicate. Which is to say, the only way I've survived the law as a means of salvation is to self-medicate. So Paul is saying, listen, the law has the effect of producing more sin, not decreasing sin. Mark Twain said it this way, the more things are forbidden, the more, they are, the more popular they become. I mean, just ladies, try this. If you have a husband and a child, which are very similar, <laughs> let's just be honest, and you're going to be gone for a couple of hours, just try this. Just, just as you're departing the house, say to your, your two children or to your husband and your, your, your child, say, hey, I'm going to be gone for a couple of hours, and while I'm gone, whatever you do, don't open that cupboard door because there's something in there that you cannot see, you cannot have, it's not for you. I'll be back in two hours. You leave the house, and these two human individuals in collaboration in cahoots will be standing there in front of that cupboard door just staring at it having a conversation and finally 
the dad will throw the kid under the bus and let the kid open the door so he can later on say, it was the kid that did it, not me. Something like that will go down. But they will, you can be certain, within the two hours that she's gone, they will open the cupboard door and at least take a peek. When things are forbidden, they become more popular. I had a lady say to me, this was so fascinating. I wrote this book a number of years ago with a kind of provocative title, but it's a title that comes from the Bible, actually. And the title is A God Named Desire. A bunch of people hated that title. They were like, what are you talking about? And then I show them in the Bible where that language is, and they're like, oh, well, I guess I have to like it because it's in the Bible. Well, this book, this, this sister came to me, and she said, she said, I just read A God Named Desire, and uh, she said, I wanted my teenage boy to read it really bad. He's like 16 years old, and I just wanted him to read it. And so when I got done reading it, she said, I went across the room where he was sitting over there, and I was about to demand that he read this book. And just as I was approaching him to demand that he read the book, I remembered something I read in the book. And I said to my son, you see this book right here? This is not for you. Don't you dare read this book. There are things in this book that are not for somebody your age should never encounter some of the stuff in this book. In fact, I'm going to hide this book away. You may never touch this book. She went and she, she put it somewhere that she knew he would know. <laughs> Later that evening, she went to his room, knocked on the door. As she opened it, he was shoving the book under his pillow. <laughs> when things are forbidden, they become more popular. We want what we can't have. So Paul is saying, listen, when the law says no, something in your flesh says yes. That's his point. Now watch this. Paul is so brilliant. But now we have been delivered from the law. Now, you don't like that any more than I do. Like, Paul, we want to proof text our way out of the gospel as Seventh-day Adventists. We want to jump to some dangling text that keeps us in bondage to the law. When Paul is trying to deliver us from the law in a way that is, in fact, our deepest and most profound need. He says, for now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by. Grammatically, what are we held by in the text? The law. It's holding us. It's got us in a stranglehold. So that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of letter. So when Paul's gospel formula is taken on board, do we cease serving God? Look at the text. Do we cease serving? No. Our serving takes on a different quality, arising from a different place. We do serve, but in newness of spirit, not in oldness of letter. Now, he says that those who believe the gospel are delivered from the law. So I wonder if you would just engage in a little exercise with me. This is going to be hard. You will have to form your lips as a Seventh-day Adventist to say words you've never said before. It will be very uncomfortable. It will feel heretical, in fact. But let's just see if it's possible for us to say this. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and I've been delivered from the law. Okay, all together now. Let's see if we can pull it up. It'll feel strange. It won't feel right. For a minute, for a split second, it'll feel so wrong. But if you can pull it off... There is liberty to be had. So all together now, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and I've been delivered from the law. Now, for those who won't believe anything, unless you have an Ellen White quote, I have one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so here's what it says. Track with her. She says, let the law take care of itself. Let the law take... What does she mean by this? Let the law take care of itself. We have been at work on the law until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa without due or rain. I've never been to those hills, but they sound pretty dry. And her point is that spiritually, you will wither and decay and die if you keep focusing on the law and I gotta and I should and I better and I ought. She's saying, let the law take care of itself. The law's a big boy. 
You don't need to preside over the law. We've been at work at the law until we're as dry as the hills of Gilboa without due or rain. Let us trust in the merits of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So she's, she's saying, let's shift the weight of our trust to Jesus and his merits. Watch this. The theme that attracts the heart of the sinner is Christ and him crucified. Now watch this. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus stands revealed to the world. And this is some of my favorite language in the writings of Ellen White right here. Jesus stands revealed to the world in unparalleled love. That is love that has no parallel. Nothing matches it. There is a love to be discovered in Jesus that is downright mind-blowing in the vernacular. Check this out. Present him thus. What's thus refer back to? Unparalleled love. Present him thus to the hungry multitudes, and the light of his love will win men from darkness to light. Present him thus to the hungry multitudes, win him from darkness, then from darkness to light. Little typo in the slides there. Don't. Are you all upset now? Calm down. Okay. From transgression to obedience and true holiness. Okay, so for those of us who are the, you know, keep the law and get victory over sin, police in Adventism. Chill! According to the prophet of God over this movement, the issues of obedience and holiness somehow take care of themselves in the light of God's love. If the gospel is preached with power and clarity, you're not going to produce more sin, but less sin. Because people will become mature spiritually. They'll be able to distinguish more clearly between what is good and bad for them. And they won't need you to police them. According to this statement, and according to what we're reading in Paul, there's one of two ways you can go about your spiritual walk, your spiritual development. You can relate to Christ through the law for salvation. So your, your primary mode of operation is to relate through law to Christ for salvation. Or you can flip the metaphor and you can relate to the law through Christ. Jesus becomes primary. He's the one you're married to, according to Paul, spiritually, not the law. You're dead to the law as a means of salvation, and you are alive to Christ as your one and only hope of salvation. You are trusting in his merits, and something begins to wake up inside of you that you've never known before. You begin to actually love Jesus. You begin to fall in love with him. You begin to like the things he likes. Well, 2 Corinthians 3 is the parallel to Romans 7. I said we're looking at two passages tonight. Romans 7, where Paul gives his marriage parable. And he distinguishes between being married to the law versus being married to Jesus. Okay? So now in 2 Corinthians 3, this is, I'm going to warn you ahead of time, this is a complex passage. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we have by and large completely misunderstood it. The first part of the passage will, for most of us, be just unfamiliar. Because we don't read it. Because we don't know what to do with it. Because it says things to us that does not fit with our theological paradigm when we are centered on the law as a mechanism of salvation. It threatens the security that we think we have in law-keeping to get in through the pearly gates. So it's not going to set well for a minute, but track with Paul's reasoning. He's a little complex here. He says, God has made us, speaking of himself and, and his little posse of missionaries who are going around preaching the gospel, and this would apply to you and me. I mean, I would apply this to all of us as followers of Jesus. We've all been made sufficient ministers of the new covenant. You and I are called upon to represent to the world in our preaching and modeling of the gospel the new covenant, not the old covenant. Because Paul says here, we have been made sufficient ministers of the new covenant 
not of the letter, remember that language in Romans 7? Not of the letter, but of the Spirit, and then he makes this profound statement. For the letter does what, everybody? The letter, and what is implied here? The letter of what? The law. The letter of the law kills, but the Spirit gives life. So I'm going to ask a simple question as we move through the passage. The letter kills in what sense? What does he mean the letter kills? You just read the Ten Commandments and biologically drop dead? No. The Apostle Paul is talking here about theological, spiritual realities, but there is a biological element. I'm going to suggest to you that the letter kills first emotionally. It deadens your sensitivity to Jesus. It turns you into a cultural formalist. You go to church, you go through the motions, you pay your tithe because you should. I have friends, Loma Linda Medical School, I've done a lot of work at Loma Linda in the past where I've gone there and, and studied with groups of students. And this is the funniest thing that I've ever encountered, and yet it's not funny, it's very tragic. These friends, all medical students, committed Seventh-day Adventists and simultaneously backslidden from the gospel. So when the weekend would come, they would go over to Reno, Nevada to gamble right up until sundown on Friday. Then go to their hotel room and keep the Sabbath. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Sundown Saturday night, back to the gambling. And paying tithe on all their winnings which you don't win a whole lot, but you get the point. Do you see what's happening there? The letter kills emotionally. The letter kills spiritually. It, 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 it has the effect of draining your spiritual energy when you are continually in a frame of mind in which you feel obligated to keep the law in order to get God's favor. It kills relationally. Seventh-day Adventist homes around the world are oftentimes a testimony to the relational wreckage that legalism produces in the home. You raise your children with a law-centered, list-centered Adventism, you will lose them. You will either lose them entirely because they'll just bag the whole thing and run away, never to return, or you will lose them while they remain slaves to the denomination. But they won't be alive to Christ. And I'm gonna to suggest to you that the letter even kills biologically. A whole lot of evidence has come in the last 20 years to indicate that legalism or a sense of condemnation actually produces a terrible biological impact have you ever been so stressed out that you feel it in the pit of your stomach? Of course you have. Well, legalism is lethal. That's what Paul is saying to us. It destroys us. It eats away our spiritual interior. Until finally, and I've met people over the years, where people are physically ill because of their belief systems. The most miserable person in the world is a Seventh-day Adventist who doesn't know Jesus. Which is to say that the most miserable person in the world is a Seventh-day Adventist who knows the doctrines, the do's, the don'ts, the commandments. Jesus is coming soon. The investigative judgment is underway. Are you going to make it? Probably not, but try. Amen. Let us close with prayer. What a great camp meeting we've had. And then you go about your business trying, trying, trying until you need medication just to deal with your religion. The most miserable person in the world is a Seventh-day Adventist who doesn't know Jesus. And Paul demonstrates this as he goes on in the text. He says, but if the ministry of death, written and engraved in stones, pause right there so we know what Paul is saying to us. You can't wiggle out of this passage by saying Paul must be talking about the ceremonial law because he explicitly says, no, I'm not. Do you see it? He says that he is talking in this passage 
about the law that is written and engraved where? In stone. Say it out loud. What law is this? It is the Ten Commandments that Paul is dealing with. What does Paul have to say about the Ten Commandments? He says that the Ten Commandments, in a sense, are a ministry of death, written and engraved in stone, and he says it was glorious. He's referring to the historical Sinai event where the law was given through Moses to the children of Israel. Was that a glorious event? Have you read the passage in Exodus? It was glorious. The mountain quaked. There was thunder, lightning. Moses came down from the mountain. His, his face was glowing. The children of Israel couldn't even look at him. Was it a glorious event historically? Yes or no? Yes, it was. And Paul acknowledges it as such. He says that the law delivered at Sinai, he says it was glorious so that the children of Israel, they couldn't even look at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance. So he's referencing the historical event. Now watch this. Which glory was passing away. Which glory was what? Passing away. The glory of the Sinai event, according to Paul, must give way to something else. It doesn't stand on its own without the gospel. Paul is saying the glory of the Sinai event is passing away, and he says, how will the ministry of the Spirit be? Now he's talking of another glory. He just said the law, the Ten Commandments, written and engraved in stone. He says that was glorious, but now he's talking about a second glory in the text, right? Are you tracking with him? He says the ministry of the Spirit, well, it's going to be more glorious. Watch this. For if the ministry of condemnation, he's referring to the Ten Commandments, had glory, and this is a theme in Paul's writings, by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Paul frames the Ten Commandment law as exerting a self-revelatory influence over people so you see your sin. And you feel condemnation when you see your sin, yes or no? Yeah, by contrast, the law shows us our sin. By the law is the knowledge of sin. For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, and according to Paul, did it have glory? Yes. The ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. What is the ministry of righteousness? Well, he just told us in the previous passages. It's the new covenant. It is the ministry he just called of the Spirit. It is the conferring of righteousness as a gift. Paul is preaching the glorious truth of righteousness by faith. And he's saying, listen, that Sinai event, that was glorious, but now Jesus is here. And when Jesus comes on the scene, if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry or the administering of righteousness as a gift exceeds much more in glory. The gospel exceeds what much more? The law. For even, for even what was made glorious, the Ten Commandments, the Sinai event had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. I want you just to imagine that you just woke up to life one evening and there's a full moon. Is it glorious? All you've ever seen is the moon in the night sky and all its brilliance. Is the moon, if you've never seen the sun, pretty awesome? But then the sun comes up and what happens to the moon? It disappears. Is it still there? It's still there. You just can't see it. Why can't you see it? Because the sun's glory eclipses the glory of the moon. In fact, let's go a step further. The light of the moon was reflective light from the sun. The Ten Commandments were always pointing to Jesus. Always. They were never a mechanism of salvation. And they were never intended to be a means of getting to God. The Ten Commandments were always meant to be 
a means by which we would so deeply, desperately feel our need that Jesus would make sense to us and we would open our hearts to him. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. Watch what he says now. For if what was passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glory. If you're going to believe the gospel as a Seventh-day Adventist, you're going to have to come to the place where you're willing to say that there is, in fact, a sense in which the law is passing away. If you're going to be consistent with Paul's reasoning, you're going to have to come to the place where you're going to have to say, wait a minute, the law in and of itself has some role, but it's not a role that has anything whatsoever to do with salvation. You're going to have to make that quantum leap theologically, and when you do, you'll feel nervous for a minute, like bungee jumping. But man, when you're flying through the sky with that level of gospel freedom, it's going to be fun. He goes on and he says this, Therefore, since we have such hope, what's the hope we have here in his context? The hope of an administered righteousness as a gift that we can't do anything to earn. Because we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Paul has been pretty bold, hasn't he? We're, we're just going to tell it like it is, Paul says. Because we've got the goods. We've got the gospel. We know it's the real thing. So I'm just going to tell you straight up, Paul says. Here's the truth of the matter. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not steadily look at the end, the telos, the teleological end to which the law was pointing all along. Paul is telling us clearly that the Ten Commandments always were pointing to Jesus. And he's telling us here very clearly that the children of Israel, they failed to theologically reason through that teleological lens. The children of Israel, they couldn't look to the end of what was passing away. They just kept camping around Sinai making promises to God that were like ropes of sand. All that the Lord has said, we will do and obey all his commandments, except on Tuesday night we're having an orgy around a fire with a golden calf. Everything God says, we will do. We promise, Moses, we'll obey from now on. Just give us another list. We'll try a little harder. Maybe we'll succeed. Paul is saying you'll never succeed. You need to come to the end of yourself and then check this out. But their minds, that is the minds of the ancient Israelites, their minds were blinded. But until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. He's saying, he's saying Jesus has now come, and there are still people to this day, Paul says, who are still blind to the gospel because they can't see past the law. That's what Paul's saying, not me. Because the veil is only lifted, it's only taken away when you finally turn your attention to Jesus. It's the only way turn to Jesus. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, to the Lord Jesus, the veil is taken away. Paul is calling you and me, he's calling all of us to turn to the Lord. And when we turn to the Lord, the veil, the blindness, the spiritual fog lifts and you see the gospel for the first time and it frees you, verse 17. Now the Lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, you'll know it, Paul says, because you'll experience liberty. You will have a freedom you've never known before. And then the last passage, the last verse in this chapter is the verse, pretty much the only verse that we as Seventh-day Adventists are familiar with. Let's look at it again. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, note the language, from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, this passage, unmoored from its context, has been interpreted over and over again in sermon after sermon after sermon to be a character development passage. From glory to glory, that is from one stage of character development to the next. 
It's on you. Get her done. It is interpreted as a character development passage, but we've just read the context now. We know that in Paul's context, there are two glories. There's the glory of the law, and there's the glory of the gospel. This isn't a character development passage. This is a paradigm shift passage. This is Paul saying, you and I need to make the transition from the law to the gospel. And when we do, transformation in ways and on levels we've never known before will begin to happen. The gospel moves us from the lesser glory of the law to the greater glory of Christ. So we close where we began with our little theological experiment. Augustine said, love God and do as you please. I asked you to think it through and ask yourself the question, is this Augustine at his best, Augustine at his worst? Love God and do as you please. What do you think? True or false? Heresy or glorious gospel truth? Well, now in our context, it just depends on where you put the emphases on the syllable, doesn't it? You can say, love God and do as you please, and you can turn it into a hedonistic statement. Or you can say, love God and do as you please. Because the love of God, as the emphasis, has an influence. Ellen White says it this way, all true obedience comes from the heart. Where does it come from? If it's true obedience. The heart. And that implies that there can be what kind of obedience? A false obedience. An appearance of obedience. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ. And if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, watch this, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. What? 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 Can you imagine, just just try this for a minute, can you imagine doing anything you jolly well please and the whole time you're doing what he pleases? Because you're in love. And why are you in love? Because you tried hard enough and pulled it off? No, because he first loved you. And the gift of his righteousness changed the entire equation for you. And you are free in Christ. I think what's going to happen is that someday, you and I, maybe it's already happened for you, maybe it hasn't, but the day is going to come when you're going to find yourself rummaging through some old lists, some old notes. I mean, go back to your Ellen White books and read everything you didn't underline. That's where you'll find the gospel. (laughs) I shouldn't have said that, but I did. Okay, so... The day is coming when you're going to find yourself kind of revisiting your spiritual history like Linda. And it's going to dawn on you suddenly out of nowhere. You're going to say something to yourself like, wow, I've been trying and trying and failing and trying and trying and failing and medicating against my religion. I've been trying and trying and failing and failing and... but." Wow, something's happened because now I find myself doing the very things that I never could do because for the first time in my life, I'm head over heels in love with Jesus because of his love for me. I have died to the law as a mechanism of salvation and I have gotten married to Christ. Father in heaven, thank you for your love, your goodness, Thank you for the glorious gospel of Christ and the gift of righteousness. Thank you, Father, that you have revealed to us through the sometimes complex and difficult to understand maneuvers of Paul and his theology. But nevertheless, Lord, we have paused and we have thought carefully about what he's saying. And Lord, there is great light in what Paul has given to us in these passages tonight. I pray, Father, for all my my friends here, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that we would all somehow see Jesus as our only hope, as our best friend, as our spiritual husband, that we would fall in love with him, Lord, and we would be free in Christ. 
in whose name we pray. Amen.